Hey, I'm Ryan Dion with Ski and Skiing Magazines. We're here with pro skier Chris Waddell to find out what he's been up to all summer, what his plans are for winter, and a little bit more about what it's like living in Utah. Talk to me about your ski background. Tell me a little bit about where you grew up, um, your path to Utah, things like that. I grew up in the in the big mountains, uh, uh, Mount Tom in Holyoke, Massachusetts is where I started out. I think 680 feet of vertical. It's about 10 minutes from our home, so my parents would pick us up at you know three o'clock in the afternoon and uh, right after school, and we'd go out. My parents actually were instructors up there, so that's I started racing at six, go there every afternoon, then went to a place called uh, Berkshire East, which is a little bit bigger. I think it was like 900 feet of vertical, and uh, raced in what's called tri-state, so Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, and then as I got older, I went to uh, Middlebury College, and I was skiing at Middlebury. At the time, my accident. So I had a skiing accident when I was when I was 20 years old. I was racing in Middlebury at the time. So tell, tell me a little bit about the accident and, and what happened and um, how that changed your life ultimately. Well, I'll tell you what I know. It's kind of funny. It was my first day of Christmas vacation. I went home. I went up to Berkshire East with my brother. We met up with a bunch of buddies and we took a couple of runs before we were going to train that day. And it was December 20th of 1988, one of those days that just sort of gets in place and in my memory. And and we took a couple of runs. It was really warm that day. My ski popped off in the middle of a turn, you know, just testing a new pair of skis, and I fell in the middle of the trail, didn't hit anything but the ground, and broke two vertebrae. So uh, so that was essentially it. I think I knew I was conscious, but I don't remember any of what happened after my ski popping off. You know, I was in shock, so didn't know what was going on. And, uh, you know, I mean, from there, yeah, things things changed a lot. But at the same time, it's kind of funny in that, that my skiing career probably would have, my, my racing career probably would have ended with graduation. Whereas I went and, and started skiing in the Paralympics, and, and my skiing career went for another 15 years or something like that. And, and I felt like I had an opportunity to do a whole lot more than I would have done before. It seemed like before it was about me trying to, you know, trying to win a race. That's what, that's, that's what you do. Whereas as a disabled athlete, I felt like I had a much bigger voice and could represent some of the possibilities for people with disabilities, that kind of thing, and, and, and stretch people's imagination. I've gone 70 miles an hour on one ski, and that sort of forces people to look at you a little bit differently. They're like, that picture of the wheelchair and that picture of 70 miles an hour, those don't exactly fit. And I'm like, good. That's exactly what I was looking for. What is what is that like men mentally, I guess, um, going from an able-bodied skier to to being in a sit ski? And, you know, what is it? Talk about the skiing aspect of it, too. Like, what is it like being in a sit ski versus on two legs? The, the beginning part was absolutely brutal because mentally I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. Like I knew the feeling of making a turn. I knew body-wise what I was supposed to do, but my body had no ability whatsoever to obey me. So I'm like, okay, we're going into a turn. This is what we do. Boom, fall over. And I kept falling over, and it was such active thought that it was so exhausting. I had to think my way down the hill, every single, like every inch of the hill, I was thinking my way down and you get to the bottom and you're like, I am so tired right now because I've been thinking the whole way down where, you know, I think the what was cool about it is that we realized that as we get better and better at something, we create bigger and bigger chunks of, of space, of, uh, you know, of, of mental space, of physical ability or whatever. And, and you put those chunks together, and that eventually becomes a race. And it was these tiny little chunks when I first started. But I got to see that progression and got to feel what it was like to make a turn again. And that was a huge advantage for me skiing in a monoski. I started skiing in a monoski in 1989. And they were really in their infancy at this point as a sport. But as an able-bodied ski racer, I felt like I knew what I was looking for. And in knowing what I was looking for, I had a huge advantage because when I felt it, I knew that I had done it. Whereas other people, if they had never felt that before, they'd have to ask somebody else, well, was that it? Was that, you know, and then go backwards. So it was a quicker progression in a lot of ways. Tell me about that. Was it, you know, is it just the sport you love and you're going to continue doing? Or how did that change you mentally? Did it give you a new outlook on life or on skiing, things like that? 
skiing was I'm first I came back to it because I loved the sport and and it was my first love it really was I mean I started ski racing as a little kid and all I wanted to do was to go to the mountain every day that I could possibly go to the mountain but it was also it was something that I shared with my friends and family and so in a lot of ways it was my it was the reflection of my of my recovery from the accident that if I started skiing again that I was recapturing my life but skiing also I felt like it owed me something it owed me it owed me myself it owed me realizing my potential and and skiing has always been my greatest teacher my greatest teacher in this in the in the sense that it was where I had my greatest success where I had my greatest failures but also where I confronted fear on a regular basis and where I had to realize how to find my best within that context of fear and not be crushed by it and so so skiing in a monoski afterwards it was this goal to figure out who I was and also how I could be successful to to confirm to myself that I could be successful so each time I got in the start in the starting gate it was well this is this is another opportunity and it was a, it was an amazing journey in that respect and and again you know, an amazing lesson that I learned from a very cool sport. Yeah, I can imagine how that would totally change, obviously change your life, but change a little bit of outlook and something you want to go back to. Yeah. What What ultimately brought you to Park City then? I know the National Ability Center is there too. Is that what brought you there? The reason I moved to Park City was because the Olympics and the Paralympics were going to be here in 2002. It was going. It was. It would be my fourth Winter Games, and it was an opportunity to leverage some of what I had done as an athlete, in and gain a bigger stage, gain the stage building up to the Olympics and the Paralympics, and to be a part of shaping and saying, hey, you know what? The world has to notice what we're doing as Paralympic athletes. Can I? Can I be a part of that? And to work with the sponsors, to work with the organizers, that was the real impetus. I'd raced here a bunch starting back in like 91 I think was the first time that I raced here in Park City and it always seemed like it was phenomenal weather especially if you're coming out of Vermont. Uh, it was great weather, it was great snow and I was like that seems like a good place to be. It seems warm and it's sunny and, and, and I didn't realize just how how close it is to the airport, how convenient it is as a mountain town, and how much that would really improve my quality of life. I didn't think I'd be here for that long, and now I can't imagine leaving. So what's your what's your home mountain? And let's say one of your best friends is coming into town for a weekend. What What's on the agenda? Uh, so home mountain, I ski mostly at Deer Valley. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I love going to Deer Valley. I think they do... They, they, they treat the customer better than, than anybody in the world. Uh, it's, 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 it's a beautiful place, full of friendly people. The mountain is tremendous. It's a lot of steep groomed stuff, which I find myself skiing a lot of steep groomed stuff these days. Uh, you know, and if I have a friend who's coming into town, I'm more than happy to go up there. And, and you know, I mean, part of it for me is, is it, it can be the same run, and it's still exciting for me. Because uh, every time it's a little bit different and I'm trying to, I thought when I retired that I would stop thinking about what I was doing technically and that has not happened. I, I still do that and so, so I think, you know, if I have a friend coming into town, it would be a lot, of, a lot of fast skiing and hopefully some great turns. What, what's your, I guess, what do you do around town too when you're not skiing? What else is on that agenda? Uh, you know, around town, it's a, a, this is a great town in the sense that that there are, the people are here for the lifestyle, and there are a lot of active people. So, so whether you know whether in the summer you're biking or hiking or playing golf or whatever, you know, all of which I, I like to do. I've done more biking this past summer than any, any of the others, but uh, but but there's that part. Uh, we have great restaurants, we have great entertainment, you know. So so for me, it's a lot of it is getting together with with friends when I'm at home after after having been on the road for so long as an athlete where coming home means taking the bag into the laundry room going washer dryer back into the bag it's nice to to have a community and feel like I actually have a home and and the friends to me are the representative part of home so is it the friends then that keeps you in Utah or, or why when you could you skied all over the world why Utah 
Uh, so it's a combination of things. I mean, certainly it is the friends. It's it's the weather. You know, it's that we get snow, that we have sunshine. It's that the summers are absolutely phenomenal, where it seems like it's blue sky every single day. Uh, it's it's all the things that you can do. It's the ways that we get to play, which I guess I've I've got a bit of a Peter Pan complex, and you know, I want to continue to play, and and it gives me all those opportunities to play right outside my garage. Uh, but it also is so close to the airport. I spend a lot of time at the airport. I'm half an hour from the airport, and I can fly anywhere in the world. So I can fly and do whatever I need to do professionally, and then come back here and be in a small town too. I'm a I'm a small town guy. It's a small town. You know a lot of people in the town. That's an important thing to me. And you know it, it, it's friendly in that respect. And I think the friendly part of it really is an important part. Speaking of the airport, any big trips planned for winter? Any anything on the list of, of where you want to go and ski this winter? <laughs> any big trips for the winter? I don't think so. I you know one of the things is you get spoiled when when you can hop in your car and have the best skiing in the world within within minutes of leaving your garage. So I'm probably going to stay mostly at home. There might be I, I don't know my my wife spends a fair amount of time in uh, in Europe in London. So we might end up doing a little bit of a European trip at some point, but we'll see. You know, I mean, that's not nothing. There, there are no plans, and you know, that that to me is kind of a fun thing too. I think we have we have a great we have great snow here, but Europe it's it's so much a part of the culture. We have a little bit of that culture here in a mountain town in Utah, but but they've been doing it for you know centuries over there. Sounds good. Stick around home and and skiing in Park City can't be bad either. I think it's going to be great. We just, you know, fingers crossed, we're going to get some snow. Fingers crossed here in Colorado too. So far, it's looking to be looking to be a good one. I know you guys have gotten some lately too, which is good. And we have exactly. Nice. Well, thanks so much for chatting with us. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to make some turns this winter too. Thanks so much, Ryan. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the whole idea of finding your greatest, right? Come on out here and find your greatest. Exactly. Thanks so much, Chris. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.